Hello. Hi, everybody. In the prior segment, Ray, Ray Franz has been lamenting the isolation of his uncle Fred, who at that time was the vice president of the society. By the time Ray was disfellowshipped, Fred was president after Nathan Knorr's death. But he makes the point several times in this chapter that Fred was very isolated, and he's not alone in that. As a, now a, just one member of the governing body, but president of the society, he represented the, the reality at headquarters, basically. Mm -hmm. and here's an instance, he says. Ray says, for me, one instance of this was notably impressive. In the 1970s, a nephew of mine contracted a sudden pancreas infection that in just three days ended his life. He was only 34. He left behind a lovely young wife and two small daughters. At the funeral, which my wife and I attended, the funeral parlor was packed. As the invited speaker, the society's vice president, great uncle of, to the deceased, walked up to the podium, paused, and then in a very loud, almost stentorian voice said, isn't it grand to be alive? After that introductory exclamation, for several minutes, he discussed effectively and dramatically the meaning of the words at Ecclesiastes 7, 1 to 4. Which read in the New World translation, A name is better than good oil, and the day of death than the day of one's being born. Better is it to go to the house of mourning than to go to the banquet house, because that is the end of all mankind. And the one alive should take it to his heart. Better is vexation than laughter, for by the crossness of the face the heart becomes better. The heart of the wise ones is in the house of mourning, but the heart of the stupid ones is in the house of rejoicing. And then Ray goes on, as yet my nephew had not been mentioned in any way. Then, after approximately ten minutes, in referring to the words about it being better for us to go to the house of mourning, the speaker, Fred, said, and the reason why is, sooner or later, we're all going to end up like this. And without turning, he threw his hand backward in the direction of the coffin where my nephew's body lay. The talk went on with further commentary on the biblical section, but with no other reference to the dead man until the close when the standard statements of the reason for the occasion and the names of the deceased survivors were given. I felt a sense of burning anger, not at my uncle, for I sincerely and honestly believe he thought this was the best way to deal with the situation, the best way to combat the natural sensations of grief and loss. What I felt incensed at was the organizational attitude that allowed a person to feel fully justified to speak in a way which essentially transformed the dead person's body into a vehicle or platform on which to base a talk, a talk that expounded organizational doctrine, but which throughout simply made no mention of sadness at the loss of the person whose life had ended, as though by ignoring this, the hurt would be lessened. I kept saying to myself, James deserves better, something better than this. Surely the text about a name being better than good oil calls for talking about the name he made for himself in life. Surely there is something that can be learned from his life, something about him that I can say to encourage us, the living. Once again, I do not think my uncle lacked any of the feelings I had or lacked a capacity for sorrow and compassion. I believe he simply reflected his training and a lifetime of disciplining himself against expressing strong feeling about anything other than theocratic interests. In the footnote, Ray says, I had been asked to give a prayer following the talk and I remember feeling somewhat choked and that I began by saying, an enemy has come into our midst and has robbed us of a loved one. A wife has lost her husband. Little children have lost a father. A father and a mother have lost a son. And we all have lost a friend. 
Then, for the first time, I could hear some expressions of sorrow among those attending, and I frankly found it a welcome sound. I tried to include some of the good things about the man, things worth our imitating, for I thought, surely now, if ever, is the time to express appreciation for whatever worthwhile qualities he had. We owe it to him, to his memory. Mm. And then he follows that with another footnote, which is a very telling anecdote about Fred himself. In the 1980s, when conducting the morning text for the Bethel family, he, Fred, emphasized the importance of the work the headquarters staff was doing by relating that, in 1939, when notified by his mother of his father's death, he informed her that he would not be able to make it to the funeral due to the severe press of work at Bethel. His mother angrily phoned Judge Rutherford, and as my uncle told it, the judge ordered him to go to the funeral. This was said with no evident sense of embarrassment, but rather as illustrative of the importance he gave to his assigned work at Bethel, the house of God. Mm. Mm. The raid recommends that we look at uh, Matthew 15, 3 to 5 at this point, uh, which reads, In reply he said to them, Why is it you also overstep the commandment of God because of your tradition? For example, God said, Honor your father and your mother, and let him that reviles father or mother end up in death. But you say, Whoever says to his father or mother, Whatever I have by which you might get benefit from me is a gift dedicated to God. So I, I think it's obvious that he he's respects and, and likes his uncle as a, an uncle, but he sees the trap that Fred has been placed in, which has, has kind of blocked out normal, natural Affection. behavior and affection yeah even towards your parents so is is it incompatible to honor your parents uh, does god not want us to honor our parents even in in uh, you know so that he's not saying i come before natural feelings god doesn't require that of us but that seems to have been uh, fred's feelings about it, that this work is, is all important and all consuming in his life. What you might call theocratic priorities take mm -hmm. precedence even over honoring your father and your mother. Mm -hmm. and, and of course that's out of whack con completely yeah. with Matthew 15 and I, I yeah. can't help but think of some incidents in my witness life. For instance, one of my friends who'd lost an infant son yeah. and the funeral and the outrage of the family who were not Jehovah's Witnesses when the funeral am amounted to a presentation of watched our beliefs about Paradise yeah. Earth. Yeah. So it, it, it did not seem to, to take into uh, account the comforting of the family in their loss. You know, and we've heard this from others too, who uh, some of them were witnesses and some of them weren't witnesses and they found this this uh, a very difficult thing to endure because it's as if you're not permitted to grieve that somehow this is is uh, a lack of faith in the coming of the paradise and and being joyful that we have a hope but th there is there has been a loss here yeah that should be recognized and and should be included in in allowing people to to be comforted in their loss yes a funeral shouldn't be just a sermon whatever that sermon is yeah. about. It should be more than a sermon. Yeah. But we, we, of course, saw that, and I remember feeling really bad about it at the time and thinking, well, what can I say? The brother who did it is very zealous. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. but he's not doing the human thing. He's mm -hmm. doing what he thinks of as the theocratic priority. But the, the Watchtower theocratic pri priorities that have now taken over prevent people from being uh, honorable to their families even like I, I've often thought the fact that my parents are getting older and yet I'm not allowed to be a good daughter to them yeah because I'm left out of the the picture how can I honor them mm -hmm. when they're ill or 
or experiencing any kind of trouble or sorrow or, or just, you know, age causes you to need extra helps from your children. But I'm not allowed to, to be a, a daughter to them. Yeah. In the next segment, Ray points out that this isolation, this unreality is not just Fred Friends. It's not just mm -hmm. the lot of Fred Friends and that it extends to most members of the governing body mm -hmm. and probably a lot more of the headquarters staff too. People who are habitually in isolation from the real world. Sheltered life. Yeah. What he calls seminarian otherworldliness. Mm 